Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. We've previously discussed the fall of Titan and how there were various forces at work on that day. Today, we're going to observe the stories of the various scientists within the New Pacific installations as they charted their way through the collapse's opening hours. We'll follow them from the briefing room to the remains of their deep sea installations, to the last few moments of those lost in Titan's final demise. A god wave sent across the world to smother it in death. This will be the last entry in our Titan series as we cover the final loose ends and complete the picture of Titan's destruction. You could adequately split down the middle the makeup of the New Pacific Arcology's senior staff. Some of them were administrators, others were scientists. Chief amongst them, though, was lead administrator Mia van der Ven, who was responsible for the day-to-day -day running and functioning of the Arcology, a position she'd held for over a century, as she'd carefully watched over Titan like a good steward. But there were more than merely civilian interests on Titan. Despite having a population of several million with material and pastoral needs, there were other things that fascinated the people of the Golden Age that were unique to Titan. Scientists such as Dr. Shanice Pell had been working on all manner of new technologies that would push humanity forward into the future, whatever that might be. But even her research wasn't as specific as what might be found deeper in Titan's oceans. This was what attracted most of the scientists, it seemed. NPA senior marine biologist Dr. Gideon Teppin, who we've already covered in this series, was interested in Arsa. We actually covered him in the Arsa video, and he was responsible for studying the life form that would be known eventually as Arsa. Back then, though, it would simply be known as a Leviathan class creature, commonly known simply as a psychic whale that was communicating to us. Communicating more specifically that there was doom approaching a creature that had formed a bond with Teppan, and the warning, regardless, that had fallen on deaf ears. Then there was the research team set within the senior arcology staff. They were the ones known best to and in closest contact with Mia van der Ven, and they were responsible with possibly the most intriguing of discoveries that could have been made on Titan, the exploration of Titan's second ocean. If you went straight down and dived into Titan's methane ocean, you would eventually reach the seabed far below. The seabed itself was set onto a massive global ice shelf that separated the methane ocean above from the liquid water ocean below. In this world of total darkness, it was theorized that it might be possible for life to exist. This might sound strange, but it's not a completely out of the question idea. Extremophile life forms do exist in all sorts of places. There are fish 10,000 leagues under the sea, that you and I will never see with our bare eyes. They still exist, though, even if we don't know that they're swimming down there. In this world of darkness, it was theorized that someone might be able to find new life, and the core arcology team was going to break through the ice beneath the arcology and explore that second deeper ocean to find out what was waiting in the darkness below. This team consisted of a variety of talented people from various disciplines but a few stood out as present members of Mia's inner circle. To start with, there was Sianna McCaig, the water oceans expert that was at the core of the project. Understanding Earth's own water oceans would be key to understanding the nature of what awaited them in the deep. It's unclear exactly if this was her only area of expertise, given that there may well have been other extraterrestrial oceans, such as those on Callisto, that might have been subject to exploration. That's to say nothing of whatever lay in the deep oceans of water below the icy surface of Europa, which we know for a fact were somewhat explored by Clovis Bray. Regardless, McCaig was bound to be the one with the greatest interest in the project's success. Then there was Murray Yamashita, the lead diver. The more hands-on team member, as can be seen by his actions, just before the fall of Titan and the arrival of the God Wave. It's likely that Murray's title of lead diver alluded to several talents. The crews on Titan made use of a research submersible known as the Diker, a name that originates from a species of African deer that would otherwise be known as a diving deer. Murray was likely the most qualified pilot of this vessel, 
Whilst the crews on Titan made use of submersibles, the technology of the Golden Age was sufficiently advanced as to allow them to use individual dive suits, as extreme depths on Titan seas weren't necessarily a challenge for the Golden Age technology. Murray was, by any records available, also one of the most experienced traditional divers within this team, and we can see as much when he dives down. Again, his title of lead diver is what allows us to make these assumptions, but more importantly, he was one who was appraised of the technical details of the experiments being conducted on Titan's methane oceans and on the sea floor. He also had some technical knowledge of the drill being used to bore into the ice. The law also makes mention of someone called Abatunde, who was another submersible operator who was aboard the Daika at the time of the collapse, but not much more is known. And then, someone who definitely wasn't part of the science team, but someone who was along for the ride, David Korosek, a famous ethicist, someone who we explored extensively last episode, someone who had a strong argument to make to the Morgan II exoframe, otherwise known as Crown Six. An American that some would simply refer to as the good man, given that he was a famous ethicist. A title that personally he hated, even though it was something he admitted allowed people to believe that there was potential for others to be better. The two project leads, Shana and Murray, were present with Mia, as well as David Korosek, and also Ishmael Barat, the connectivity supervisor of the Arcology. His role is not well explained either, but by the duties he enacted during the moments of Titan's collapse, it's perhaps possible to assume that the title of Connectivity Supervisor implies that he was responsible for communications, data aggregation, and adaptive planning around that information. He was specially trained to analyze a great amount of information all at once, with the intent of still focusing on a single task that required all, or perhaps none, of the outside context. By all accounts, it seems clear that he was not only highly capable as part of the core arcology staff, but may well have been a genius. The first hint that any of them got that something was wrong came from Asa. She had escaped the grasp of the witness and those that had been corrupted by it, and was desperately trying to save those new people that she had come to know. But of course, even as she reached out to Dr. Gideon Teppin before the calamitous events that destroyed Titan, so too would she find that the other scientists would not listen. Unfortunately for all involved, Arsa's warning would fall on deaf ears. It's unlikely that the Arcology leadership even knew of her warning. It's entirely possible that Dr. Gideon Teppin wasn't taken seriously. And so, the one harbinger that might have been able to warn them of this terrible calamity was ignored. And so, the fate of the people of Titan was sealed. One day, an early alert was sent out by Rasputin. The alert was a simple command to evacuate the Arcologies. The nature of the War Mine's authority was such that the alert prompted immediate distress within the Arcology staff, as well as a little questioning. These first records are revealed in the last days on Kraken Mare law book. They read as follows. It's real, Mia van der Ven decides. We evacuate. Citizens first, then the old guard. And we assume that we're never coming back. No one breathes. Down beneath their meeting table, pouches of farmed salmon, beef en couture, buttered carrots, and bok choy drift in the slow turbulence of a sous vide bath. On Mir's 100th anniversary as the new Pacific Systems and Facility Administrator, she cashed in all, well, not quite all, of her favors and installed a pocket restaurant beneath her table on the command deck. She liked the edible metaphor, the idea of watching your food slow cook all day before the meal. Savor the future you're making. If she's right about what's happening now, then there will be no more long-term thinking, no more patience, and maybe no future at all. She waits for Siana to boil over first. Siana's the water ocean expert. She has the most to lose. Finch tiny Siana McCaig slams her fist down with not a tenth of the strength that her chimp splice muscles could summon. Now? Now. We can't leave. We just finished the borehole. We're one day from a crude expedition into Titan's biggest secret. And you want us to just leave it all? I do. 
Mia says, sadly. Mari Yamashita, her lead diver, leaps in with the details she can always trust him to catch. Boss, if we abandon the borehole and the waterlock, all the equipment's down there, bathing in liquid methane, hydrogen sulfide, carboxylic acid. Leave it too long and we'll lose everything. There are almost three million people on this arcology and its rigs. Connectivity supervisor Ishmael Barat's Zen Shura training distills his attention down to a single laser bright point. He is here with Mia, even as his brain drifts on a hundred different data feeds. If you're serious about evacuating, we'll need to slot people into smile pods and move them as bulk freight. It's the only way to get the population out. There'll be economic damage, there'll be deaths. If this is a false alarm... It's not a false alarm, the good man says. This voice Mia didn't expect, but only because he's the new guest at her table. David Miguel Korosek, a man who's literally never harmed a fly, who wouldn't eat plants lest he destroy a sacred entropy pump. Poor David. He came here to make first contact with new life. The wonders that flourish, not in Mia's ocean, the methane sea on Titan's surface, but in the enormous water world that lies below Titan's 50 kilometer ice shell. He is an ethicist. He wanted to help them do it right. Shiana crosses her arms. Her recombinant muscles make lean knots at the shoulder anchors, where her bones are more than bones. How do you know? Korosek gives her his full attention, respecting her question. He is a tall, graceful, dark-eyed man with lashes so thick he seems like he's wearing permanent eyeliner. Mia remembers something from his book about cognitive empathy. Show that you have made a model of their thought. Show that you have listened to it. He responds. Since I don't have any more information than you, how could I possibly be so certain? Yes, Siana says, impatiently. That's what I asked. He holds her gaze. Mia thinks that he may have annoyed her, but also that he knows he's done nothing wrong. The AIs who issued the evacuation order use a hammer-forged extrapolation of human morality. It is tested in trillions of simulations under the wildest circumstances imaginable to be sure their moral decisions agree with human values. They're not just rationality pumps. They care. They care the way a perfect human being with infinite compassion for all things would care. They couldn't issue an evacuation order unless it was right. This is not a false alarm. After the arrival of the ethicist David Korosek to the meeting, it was decided swiftly that the alert was authentic. In spite of the hesitations from the diver, Murray, and Shiana, who was of course keen to explore the ocean beneath, and in spite of Ishmael pointing out the requirements on a logistical level to evacuate millions of citizens from Titan, the decision was made, and thus the leadership had set its course. Everyone has had their say. Mia puts her hand down on the cold tabletop. We're going to evacuate. Tiana, call Babatunde and get the Diker up from the borehole. I want them moored in the submarine pen in three hours. We'll start potting citizens in the domes, then use local blue water shipping to haul them out for orbital pickup. She likes to call the surface ships blue water, even though Titan's oceans aren't water, or blue. It reminds people she's old-fashioned. Then, we evacuate the ship crews. Then, we go. Ishmael Barat opens his mouth to say something. She will remember afterward the way all the fine hairs of his immaculate beard whispered off each other in that last instant before it happened. An alert detonates in her sensorium, and when everyone else at the table except Ishmael flinches in surprise, Mia knows that she has just watched a history bomb detonate, a blast of irreversible change. Suban Allah, Ishmael says, which is his third language, Arabic. Wow. Also, my apologies if that's not well pronounced. I guess it's not a false alarm, Murray Yamashita murmurs. The alert scrolls through Mia's mind, 
in that hallucinatory screen space that matches but never impairs normal vision. Traveler departs Io, terraforming incomplete, accelerating toward Earth, behavior unprecedented. Sometimes Mia thinks she can feel the new Pacific Arcology moving beneath her, as if the flex of that 160-meter substructure of plasteel and spin metal that anchors new pack to the ice shelf is also a flex in her sinews. Maybe, like Shiana, her bones are more than bones too. And whenever that happens, she thinks, gasoline rains from the sky here, and it is minus 180 degrees Celsius outside, and no matter how comfortable we grow, life is tenuous here. Human life especially. And now, it's going to end. She says to her crew what she will say to the mayor. We've got to get everyone off this city. Wherever the traveler is going, that's where it's safe. Then she looks to David Korosek, who made his name as the good man by proposing humanity's best and most rigorous theory of the traveler's morality. The traveler will protect us, no matter what happens, correct? David looks back at her with all the heartbreaking honesty of a child. Yes, he says. It can't do anything else. In spite of the efforts of the science crews and the staff of the Arcology to evacuate, Rasputin had chosen to contain them. Dr. Shanice Pell's work would be a cause of imminent concern to the Warmind for reasons that we haven't been able to discern, and its directives enforced a zero-tolerance policy on Titan. As each evacuation ship ascended, it was promptly shot down by the Warmind's weapon systems on every warsat in orbit. Even as this grisly fate was starting to unfold though, the people of Titan were yet to see the true power and devastation approaching them. Titan was soon to be sieged by a power beyond even that of Rasputin. The Witness would use its power to manipulate the gravity of the world and pull at one spot on Titan's oceans. The revelation of this moment would first come to Ishmael Barat, who would then quickly relay it to Mia van der Ven in the moments before Titan's fate was sealed. This happened just as Mia was witnessing a heated verbal battle between David Korosek and his former companion, who went by the designation of Crown Six, a working Seraph operative. They had all just seen Rasputin shoot down the transport where Dr. Shanice Pell had found refuge and was looking to escape Titan. Mia does not get to hear the rest of this conversation, because a message explodes in her sensorium with such demanding totality, it numbs her fingers. Boss, Ishmael Barat shouts, we're accelerating. What? Mia conjures up telemetry from Titan's satellite halo. What's accelerating? She calls for radar data, a map of Titan's surface, and then she sees it. Her moon is squashing. Titan is deforming from a spheroid into an egg. Something out there is pulling on Titan. A hand with a force greater than Saturn's entire mass. And the moon is answering the only way it can, by bulging outward. Already 15 meters, still growing. The pull will cause strain, tremors, tides, and when that pull lets go, there will be a wave to make Siosudra and Atrahasis and Noah and Manu and Diokalion cower in fear. Urgelmir might have navigated a deluge of blood, but not even he had to sail on liquid methane, nor reckon with the apocalyptic tidal forces of a second ocean, 14 times as vast as Earth's oceans combined, buried 50 kilometers below the surface. This was the nature of the doom that befell Titan, and most unfortunately of all, there were those who had gone down into the depths of the methane ocean to help. Lead diver Mori Yamashita had taken to a personal diving suit and was working his way to the bottom of the Arcologies, making his best effort to free that which to most would matter the least, small native creatures that he would refer to as swarmers. As best we know, no. 
not related to the exotic or to threadlings. He risked his own life to save tiny sentient lives of Titan's own creature biome. He had no way of knowing that they would empathize, no way of ever being thanked by them. He simply knew that, morally speaking, it was the right thing to do, even as terrifying as it was. He dived into darkness to save things that wouldn't even know his name. And Murray was halfway down when the collapse would begin. Murray Yamashita dives through bad water. It's not water at all, but that's what the dolphins have nicknamed it. Bad ocean, because it sucks to swim in it. At nearly minus 200 degrees Celsius, the methane is so viscously frigid that vacuum, the acne of pure cold, is actually keeping Murray warm. He wears a soft suit stuffed with microscopic layers of vacuum, packed in turn with crystalline nanostructures that prevent even light from crossing the gaps. This means the chill cannot get in, and his body heat cannot get out. So he is now baking to death in an ocean as cold as Dante's Ninth. Of course, he could vent heat. The suit allows that. But the spreading warmth will force nitrogen out of the methane-ethane ocean, and the bubbles will slow him down. This is unacceptable for a lot of reasons, one of which is that he's already too slow. Liquid methane is about half as dense as water, so his huge fins and hissing thrusters struggle to push against it. Another reason is that he will die if he can't get back inside in time. Murray, his sensorium whispers. He turned the volume way down. Come back. This isn't worth your life. Sorry, Mia, he thinks. It has to be worth my life. Or I am worth more than them. And I know I'm not. I put them there. It's my job to let them out. He always loved the stupid little swarmers. Dome 2's understructure crouches above him, a maze of ultralight support struts and twisting bundles of cable. The shadow of a behemoth supercarrier blocks the dim sunlight above. He feels the thin howl of the ship's thrusters, fighting to move out of mooring at Dome 2 and haul another load of frozen people to an evacuation lifter. If Murray looks down, his lights illuminate a dusty wash of azotosomic plankton primitive methane life. If he looks back to Dome 1, he can barely see the sleeky fat form of the Diker, the water ocean research submarine docked to the Arcology's underside. E.F. Babatunde is there now, probably begging someone to tell them what's happening. He heads down. His dolphins are already safe in open water. He has to get the swarmers out of their research pen. Tidal anchors decoupled, Gianna McCaig reports. Dome 1 substructure is as loose as I can make it. Dome 2 is showing temperature faults, but I've got drones on the way. Murray, please, we have no idea what will happen when the quake hits. Get back in here. I'll be back in a few, he promises. I'm just going to cut the research pens open so the swarmers can get free. Oh, Allah, Ishmael Barat whispers. It's gone. What's gone? Mia demands. The tidal pull, the ghost mass, it just left. The moon is collapsing back to spheroid shape. I'm detecting primary waves in the subsurface ocean. It's a quake, it's a quake. Murray, get away from the substructure, get clear. Murray imagines 60 plus meters of bulging moon. Titan's mass hauled up into a teardrop pointed at the sky, suddenly released smashing and scraping and grinding back into equilibrium. Cracks in the ice, spewing plumes of water and ammonia, continent-sized shelves slamming and rebounding and carving like bergs, the whole vast inner ocean sloshing back into its shape. The swarmers, he says, and he jettisons his buoyancy tanks. Without the lift, he is so much denser than the bad water around him that he plunges like a skydiver towards the cross brace below, where the swarmer pen is anchored. Titan's gravity may be gentle, but even gentle acceleration adds up. He hits hard, and the spin metal surface blasts the air out of his lungs. He gasps and gags, scrambles for purchase before he slides off 
and falls into the abyss. He's going over. No, no, he's not going over. He will not fall. The gecko grips surface on his forearms catch and hold. Phew, he says, and he has never meant anything so inane so deeply. The swarmers seethe and pulsate in the perforated plastic sack. Not Titan's highest life, nor its lowest. They hive across the icy sea bottom in enormous braided patterns that speak to Murray of intelligence. Not individually, not even at the hive level, but some kind of vast concert, conducted perhaps by leviathans down beneath the ice shell, communicating across the barrier by magnetic whisper that the swarmers receive via organic squids. An ecology spanning methane life and water ammonia life. Why? How? Murray wants so badly to know. But if his curiosity brought the swarmers here, only for them to be caught in the quake, dashed apart against the arcology struts, he'll never forgive himself. He should have set up a remote release. But he was complacent. He gets a fistful of the pen's smart plastic surface and fires the disintegrate signal through his glove. The polymer shreds and the swarmers scatter, their tiny bodies siphoning liquid methane as they pump down and away. Safe. Safe. I made it, he calls jubilantly. I'm on my way back up. The quake hits. 150 meters below, the icy basis of Kraken Mare rolls like liquid. The arcologies answer the low geological wail with a cacophony of groans and shrieks, joints flexing, tethers snapping taut, substructures soaking up unthinkable mechanical energy, trying to keep anything from… breaking. Something must have frozen hard down in Dome 2's substructure. Something must have grown brittle. The snap is almost spinal. The smashed hulk of a dome tumbles past Murray as he tries to scull backward, away from the super-dense arm of Plasteel dropping like a guillotine through all too thin methane to strike him in the- He is on the icy sea floor, 240 meters down. Someone's shouting in his ear. It's Mia. She's always there in an emergency, always there for her team. Murray? Murray, you're awake. Respond if able. His sensorium tells him he's been in a medical coma while cyto machines fight to save his life. Massive blunt trauma. Concussion. The suit, as ever, tougher than the human being inside. Dome 2 has toppled partially. It's leaning toward the sea on damaged substructure. He should go help. Murray. Mia says, in a level voice he does not recognize. He's never heard her scared before. Listen to me. The quake is over, but a shelf of ice collapsed into Kraken Mare. The displacement wave is coming in now, and you won't be safe on the bottom. You must reach the surface and get above wave level. That will be at least 50 meters. Surface? Wave? About 50 meters? Murray cues a blast of noatrope to clean up his thinking and grunts aloud in shock. He gets it. Oh, he gets it now. He has to run. I understand. I've lost my buoyancy. Ascending on thrusters. He makes it to the surface. He's up there in plenty of time. He can even see Dome 1, still intact, though a lot of the surrounding rigging is damaged. One of the creepy exo-soldiers stands outside, beckoning to him with a laser dazzle, guiding him in. Murray opens his suit wings to their full membranous span. A single mighty stroke of paramuscle cups the air and hauls him up out of the sea. He is aloft. Titan air is thick, and Titan's gravity is light, and like a huge bat, he can fly. He puts his head down and starts building altitude, heading toward the beckoning exo. The Exo's laser blinks code at him. Go with God, you poor. Murray looks back. First, he sees the supercarrier. Tragically buoyant, tragically light. 
built for seas with gentle one-meter tides, but now riding the greatest wave Titan has ever seen directly into Dome 2's crippled understructure. The 152 kilopascals of air pressure, the pandemonium sound of collision has the gut-mulching power of a rocket booster. The entire arcology collapses down onto the ship, into the sea. Then he blinks past the devastation and recognizes the sheer scale, the utter speed, the complete imminence of that unthinkable methane wave coming down at him. Oh man, he says. This was the fate of Titan. Whilst some of the Arcology systems would survive, the majority of the domes were left in total ruin. Nobody would live to tell this tale. And thus, our story of the destruction of Titan is complete. The waves that rendered all life cleansed from this world, but for a few survivors, had passed. The collapse was complete on Titan. The witness stood, momentarily victorious. To this day, the nature of Titan has not changed. Death permeates the moon now more than ever. But in the darkness, we have found a hope that defies our expectations. Arsa's survival and her delivery of key intelligence to us has potentially saved all of existence if her words on the Witness's power are to be believed. Even in these dark times, we must keep moving forward. If not for the sake of tomorrow, then for the sake of yesterday. For the people of Titan's Arcologies, who perished, believing that there might be a tomorrow. For Mia van der Ven, for David Korosek, for Shiana McHaig, for Ishmael Barat, for Mare Yamashita, for all those unnamed on the rig, for all those who had hope for the tomorrow that they would never see. But that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, go ahead and leave a like and leave your own thoughts down below in the comments section. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, you can also hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications and stay up to date with all my Destiny content. Thank you very much for watching as per usual though. And as always, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Baif. Rodasia Adastra. I'll see you, Starside.